with Thai. And for the past two years, I've personally been involved with Thai, and I really appreciate uh, the kind of stories that I have heard. And it will be really, uh, it sometimes it's inspiring to see the kind of effect that Thai has had on startups. And uh, while this uh, lockdown is happening, we felt it would be really good if we can come together as KPMG as a firm and maybe give you all of you budding entrepreneurs and probably successful entrepreneurs some flavors and insight into how the market is developing. Uh, what is it that we have seen traditionally as trends that have happened before the lockdown and how the scenarios and everything is going to be changing and what are the paradigm shifts that you're going to be seeing across once the lockdown ends. And uh, in fact, I would like to invite our first speaker for the day who's actually quite literally seen uh, the entire startup story happen in India. He's been involved with uh, so many e-commerce platforms. So I would request Amarjeet to kind of, uh, kind of brief the audience on what we're really talking about and take over. Oh, Amarjeet's on mute. I'll unmute him. Amarjeet, you're on. Uh, I think Rahul, you'll have to unmute Amarjeet. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, he's on. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. And this is my first chance to speak to you guys. Uh, yes, I've been involved with the startup ecosystem for a long time. The first startup I worked for was Make My Trip. So we are talking about uh, late uh, 90s and 2000s when I started working with Deep in relation to his company. And post that, I think um, I've been actually very lucky to have been associated with uh, most of the unicorns that you see. Uh, and as a result, I think uh, today um, the firm has given me the responsibility to lead the unicorn practice of KPMG. Uh, and uh, I've been Uh, I've been with uh, most of them, uh, and I've been coming to draft the entire startup policy for uh, for, uh, for India. And we were working with DPIIT for almost three years, uh, having worked on all the tax incentives that you see today in the uh, startup policy, whether you see any FEMA-related matters or whether any benefits which you are getting under the MCA. So that's something, you know, I was personally involved uh, with the government for almost... Uh, uh, one year uh, for us to actually negotiate those benefits for the startups. And so if I just look at the startup policy for the country today, it's quite dynamic and the government is always interested in doing more. Uh, and you would have seen that uh, anytime there's a problem, um, the government actually responds. It takes time because uh, uh, whatever you may say, Indian bureaucracy is still an elephant. But uh, at the same time, they are very proactive if you go and talk to them of, of, in relation to any problem with the startup ecosystem. My experience has been very good uh, when we've been interacting with the government in relation to trying to get some benefits uh, for the startup ecosystem. Uh, and uh, I hope in this COVID situation also, I have seen um, the uh, representation that has been sent by Thai uh, mm -hmm. on, on some of the benefits which the government should pass on uh, to the startup ecosystem. I hope that uh, those benefits are provided. Uh, there are, uh, at the same time, other uh, chambers also who are working on those things. And I feel very strongly that the startup, startup ecosystem has to be supported today. Because it's, uh, therefore, I think when we talk about startup ecosystem, and you know, my uh, other speakers are going to talk about uh, what are the kind of uh, work we have done for them how we've been involved in a number of journeys for a number of times. But at the same time, you know, um, I just want to talk about, you know, over these years, I've seen various business models. I have met a number of founders, promoters. I have seen a number of ideas. You know, when we talk about founders, we usually talk about the pedigrees of the founders, the engineers, the accountant. They've come with some brilliant ideas. But, uh, you know, the problem arises is... Um, when they come to the stage of even the POC, uh, there's a lot of uh, lot of issues these people fail, uh, face because while our ecosystem is very prescriptive in terms of uh, uh, when we talk about the policy, etc., 
uh, we might have a large section of mentors we have large uh, vcs but when it comes to actually looking at the business model itself looking at the revenue model of that particular thing i find um, a number of people actually face a challenge around that because they can think of an idea but uh, actually what could be a revenue model around that based on which they ultimately will succeed is something most people uh, fail to actually identify that and that's where i think over the years uh, i've been uh, working along with a number of companies just to see that uh, the idea is there but how it can be converted into revenue that is the most important thing so you know one thing uh, while uh, there have been business model the b2b the b2c b2b to b2c horizontal versus b2c you can talk uh, hours and hours about the various business model but one thing which i have seen is people who have succeeded I have been able to work with a number of them. These guys have just always relentless when they have been pursuing whatever they are doing. Uh, they have been uh, their business model has to be relevant in all the situations. You have to think about. I might be in a very small vertical, but it has to be relevant. That is. Amarji, uh, your voice is just dipped a little bit. Couldn't hear the last five seconds. can you hear me now or something better yeah yeah perfect yeah, yeah. so i'm just saying uh, one thing which is uh, very important that the relevance of that business model has to continue you know as we go to the no uh amajit we can't again we've lost you Uh, is there an audio problem? Can uh, Angad maybe you or Manoj can you hear me or? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I think so. We may have lost Amarji. So Angad, maybe you can uh, uh, continue from there and maybe yeah, absolutely. If Amarji joins, then we can uh, have. We can. Of course. so what we can do is uh, we can start with the classification if you could just move to that slide please amrit yeah it will give us a, a good starting point to continue from where amarji dropped off yes perfect so uh, for everyone as you see the slide uh, this is a classification that we had prepared a couple of years ago as the startup ecosystem had started uh, evolving firming up and we were understanding with the rest of the industry on how things are going to pan out uh this is in a way the b2c internet ecosystem as we call it and uh if you see the center depicts the broader classifications then splitting down into some more micro detail and surrounded by some of the ecosystem players now as some of you will quickly see that over the last 2 to 3 years itself this slide itself would have changed a significant bit so with the the space at which the startups are coming up with innovation the pace at which customers are requiring different um, types of products and services today we have health tech as as a much much larger uh, startup ecosystem for example from wearables to fitness tracking to predictive analytics recommendation engines and what not now for this entire startup ecosystem to build the way it has each of them have a dependency on partners on associates on elements of cataloging on marketing agencies on customer support the entire array of things which you see on the outer periphery of the circle now if a similar classification we do for any of the core industries a consumer markets or industrial markets a telecom firm the outer periphery which you see will consist of odd number of startups or new technologies which may not even have existed a few years 
so that is the area which forms the core today and that is what increases the importance that even for a core vertical there is significant dependency being created on the startup ecosystem and how did that come about happening so which is where we chose the two key levers which we'll be spending the next few minutes on one being customer experience and the second being supply chain now from a customer experience perspective it's of course not a new topic it's something which has been discussed debated and has been around for as long as there has been buying and buying or selling so what drove this change or, or what would be different today now the difference is that earlier organizations had the time to build on their customers experience iteratively so over a steady growth they had enough time within the organization to build up to a right customer experience and sustain it today however because most of the startups are internet enabled the pace at which they scale may itself be faster than these iterative improvements so it's extremely important that the experience that you start with and you build upon is already a mile ahead now an important thing to note here is that uh, kpmg does do globally a uh, customer experience excellence survey and year on year the customer experience scores have been increasing the an important part of that increases that there are startups which are revolutionizing this change they are able to because it's easier to start with a revolutionary change than to bring in incremental changes let me take you through a couple examples of stories where we have seen that happen and we have been a part of that journey so there's a very interesting startup uh, yeah there's a very interesting startup with which wanted to bring uh, something as as traditional as steel trading online so to bring in transparency to bring in variety for a buyer to incorporate the aspects of contract management now a very simple question which came up when we started the due diligence on the idea is why can not some of the larger players which are already into steel trading do that from day one and that took us into some discussions with industry experts to figure out that the process has been so well established in that it's easier to start from scratch with a new organization than to change the way it is done today so that that flexibility which comes in from a new idea and a new organization driving change is perhaps what's bringing it up now overall to deliver a better experience even established organizations are heavily leaning on the startup ecosystem in another case one of our clients which happens to be one of the largest nbfcs in india they actually set up a seed stage venture fund they set up an open fund to identify the right startups to invest in and to grow their own organization with them the idea being that there were certain startups which even at their early stage were competing large behemoth on for example experience on the way analytics is driven on the way some of the services are divide, uh, distributed digitally so even an a large organization identifying smaller startups to help them on this customer experience journey is something which is very much prevalent today now there are six pillars which govern this entire customer experience and i won't go through each of them but i'll just run through so integrity and empathy you would of course understand the resolution is something which is becoming more and more important today that just fixing a problem is not good enough but it should be followed by what is called a heroic response so one of our clients which is a, a large grocery delivery firm which you know and you may have personally experienced when the orders went extremely high during the covid scenario and they were not able to fulfill all all of them cancellations happened and the refund is typically a uh, vouchers of credit which is given back to the customers now knowing that in this scenario liquidity is extremely important they proactively of returning the money back to the payment mode that it came from and this was without some of us including me myself for instance raising that as a concern so that was a heroic recovery from a problem which was being generated the next ones which we have is expectation managing so knowing what a customer would want even before the customer does and this echoes with what we know from say a henry ford or a steve jobs when they said that if you ask the customer they revert with faster horses as the thing that they want or steve jobs saying that you have to show people what they want an elim personalization and reducing the customer's time and effort so let me go a little bit deeper over the next couple of minutes with one of the startups or early stage organizations that we are currently working with now it's a coffee manufacturer or rather a coffee powder manufacturer and someone who's just entered into the business of coffee vending machines now this is a client that we again are learning with as they adopt to a, a new way of working and establishing the paradigm of what would be a customer experience in this case for a coffee vending machine their customer is going to be our offices so a b2b scenario 
it could be a hotel it could be a travel waiting room anywhere where customer end customers may want coffee now for them the entire concept of premise was built on the fact that a customer expectation is for to have a certain type of coffee now in the in the entire competitive ecosystem you see there are large organizations which are already very well entrenched in coffee vending machines they have iot enabled means they have a reach and and the ability to turn at the machines and servicing much much faster so how do they differentiate so they identified the expectation that they will give the exact taste which you will get from a handmade filter coffee so they brought in a differentiation and introduced the concept that any customer sitting in an office from an automated machine will be able to get the same taste of a filter coffee with the right amount or the right flavor of a burnt milk now in that case if you imagine if you are able to differentiate yourself it's one foot into the door what else can you do now in order to give through an experience which is differentiated you will of course end up incurring a cost maybe a different machine a different quality of beans so there will be uh, a slightly higher premium which is charged so how do you justify it? so in that case they brought over the second lever which is of integrity that on a per cup basis while higher they did side of two machines to figure out that the number of cups which have been uh, serviced through two, two different machines itself is different so even though on a per cup basis the price is different you actually end up realizing a larger number of cups from the starting point so integrity comes in similarly in today's day they have picked the third lever which is of empathy now overall in a covid scenario for example a coffee vending machine plays a very different and they are playing it to their strength so for example they have put a question to the admins of various offices that in this scenario would you prefer your candy and manually developed coffee would you prefer someone getting it through thermoses without knowing process or would you go to an automated machine which is very much in your premises and where you control how the entire uh, coffee is prepared who touches it so obviously it becomes is a very different approach which comes in now with that actually move to supply chain as well uh, before i hand over to anuj on a supply chain perspective realized one thing and i'm sure all of you can resonate with it that the front end and the back end organization can no longer run in isolation so they may be extremely efficient but in order to in, in align today and provide the customer experience which we spoke important to connect them with wrong so if you look at levers out of the hundreds of levers which govern a supply chain you today need a very rapid delivery system so a realistically aligned system to instant gratification you will need bidirectional supply chains for any kind of customer experience today returns is a key event you are dependent on an extended system of suppliers so everything cannot be done by you you will need your own partners who can help you do this from technology to logistics to tracking and largely you will need to equip yourself with analytics and a very detailed planning module so that you can use both external and internal information to the full so let me give you a quick story here on how some organizations have gone through this uh, there is a very large e-tailer that all of us use today about a few years ago when they had started this journey we worked with them on how to optimize their supply chain and a very interesting point came up so for those of you who are into products would know that whenever supply comes in from uh, vendors to your warehouse there is a three way check which happens you do a reconciliation between invoices between the prpo and the physical goods which have arrived the gate entry receipts now a question was supply from this then very young organization that this entire reconciliation is a bottleneck to what we are trying to do and it increases the time in which our goods can reach the customers so they posed us a challenge that they want to do away with this three way reconciliation and of course from within our team we were also looking at at core financial controls operational controls and this was something which could not be done so we went through a step by step discussion on what could go right or what could go wrong leading up to aspects of today if you permit a vendor to send in everything the vendors can perhaps start dumping their and it becomes a financial 
So step by step, aligning to the right process where a customer's expectation and what is the control which an organization should bring in helped establish a new process which was not deployed by any other player in this uh, in the entire ecosystem. It was a combination of what could be automated, what could be done manually, what has to be done at the warehouse, and extremely importantly, it started a journey of partnering with the vendors itself. So there are certain things which could be proactively done by the vendors even before they dispatch the goods. And today, if you see over the five-year period, that has actually become the norm. So overall, with that, I'll just take a minute to conclude and then pass over to Manoj. There are two things which all of you in your own capacities, in your own organization should take away from this. The first one being that increasingly customer patterns are moving towards what we call a multi-channel approach. So your product or services could be bought online today. Your competitors could be bought through a physical store. There are certain products or services which at least for a near future will always be bought online and others will always be bought offline. So firms which are able to uh, facilitate this or enable a customer to shop the way they want to do it, this could be B2C or B2B and shop when they want to do it will eventually win out. And the second very important takeaway, which you would have heard from the case studies as well, is that you have to engage, integrate, and manage. So that means instead of trying to grow in isolation, you have to think of a collaborative approach, work with some of the others who are supplementing what you are doing, which will increase your speed to market, which will reduce your costs, which will mitigate your risk, and probably help you close on some capability gaps which you have today. So both of these put forth the entire concept of building the right supply chain, delivering the right customer experience, and as organizations for you to figure out where your strengths lie and where you can supplement it from the ecosystem support. So with that, pass and uh, pass over to Manoj. Thanks, Angad. I, I hope I'm clear. My voice is clear. Yeah, yes. Manoj. Okay, great. So thanks, Angad. Like I was saying, I mean, very interesting stories and uh, uh, partially this is the this is the excitement and the thrill of working with startups that while the standard consulting toolkit applies, uh, but the solutions need to be very, very innovative. And uh, uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of startups. I've also have friends who have, who own startups. So it's, it's always refreshing to uh, discuss with them and uh, about their business problems. So now with, with what uh, Angad has covered, now we will move to uh, uh, a slide on what do we think will be the shifts uh, post COVID and uh, just as a food for thought for all of you to think about that, how can you take advantage of these shifts? How will these shifts impact you? And, uh, and, and hence, you know, uh, how can you modify the way you are, you are doing business to, to take advantage of this? So, Amrit, if you can please go to the previous slide. Yeah. yeah so these are the seven shifts that we have, we have identified. And of course, uh, if uh, COVID continues to be a very dynamic situation, uh, but this is just food for thought for all of us. So, the first one is that uh, across the board, and this is not just startups, this is also established companies, we are seeing a business model shift. And uh, the dimensions of these are really shifting towards localization. So a lot of companies uh, who, uh, whose competition is actually imports are, are seeing interest uh, and, uh, and JVs and, and m and talks about how do we localize some of some part of the supply chain. Uh, there is a there is also a reorientation of the whole supply chain in the sense that if you if you look at for example the B2C business uh, the FMCG FMCD business uh, then there uh, while the traditional distributors retailer channels are still there but there are a lot of opportunities for startups for other companies to come in and solve problems uh, like uh, uh, how to do last mile delivery. You know how to provide transparency and visibility of the goods that are there at, at various parts of the supply chain to the companies. The good news is, and 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 this is a positively a, a, a possibly a silver lining is that while previously there used to be a lot of resistance uh, about uh, about you know anybody new coming into this supply chain, COVID has led to a lot of openness because uh, companies are genuinely seeing the benefit of somebody bringing in that transparency. And the business models that will succeed are the ones which in the short term, not necessarily replace the distributor, but actually figure out a way to work with them. So, so that is one example that we are seeing of this, uh, you know, supply chain reorientation in the FMCG business. There are also a lot of new alliances. And while in the news, you may have heard about 
the alliances where Zomato, Swiggy, etc., tying up with the larger players. But even behind that, there are a lot of smaller uh, uh, startups that are uh, that are becoming active more in the B two B space or more in the space of actually making sure uh, that uh, that this idea of transparency and and end to end delivery uh, yeah. is taken care of. So that's the first shift and uh, something that uh, uh, that uh, that all companies need to think about. Uh, now, while uh, this this business model shift is happening, one also needs to think about that how is the consumer behavior going to drive this business model shift. So earlier, if uh, uh, consumers spent spent a lot of time uh, going out to shop, but now of course that is not going to happen. And some of those some of these things will also uh, continue post COVID. Uh, and and hence, how can companies, how can startups take advantage of that that shift? The second really is that digital is going to get a real push. And uh, initially also before COVID, we were seeing a lot of conversations on digital transformation, but, but this will just certainly accelerate all of that. Uh, and the primary reason behind this is that uh, uh, when we used to do digital transformation, there used to be a big element of uh, change management. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, change management in terms of changing the way people behave changing the way people interact with digital channels. But now a lot of those barriers have been removed. So uh, people are trying work from home. People are trying new channels. People are trying, uh, uh, you know, new B2B partners. So, so hence this particular thing will get a big push and, uh, and companies or startups in this area can expect uh, a lot of business coming their way if they can really capture these trends. The other is on cybersecurity. Uh, a lot of smaller companies who didn't really invest uh, in cybersecurity or in platforms like uh, for remote working like Zoom are actually realizing that they need that investment. So that also is becoming very, very relevant. The third thing is really, uh, uh, and, and this is something which uh, is, is being seen immediately, but also over the next few quarters, uh, there, will, there will be companies which will prioritize cash flows. And what this means is that companies will be will be ready to pay extra if they are able to uh, get an advantage on the on the cash flow or the working capital. So any business that can take advantage of this trend will also be able to uh, you know really uh, uh, be more relevant for their for their clients and customers. Uh, the next is uh, moving away from uh, fixed models. So and and this is something that we are seeing almost immediately. We have at least two or three. Uh, such uh, projects running where companies are asking us, how do I really, uh, uh, you know, automate my uh, my GNA spend, my uh, overhead cost, and uh, uh, can I look at outsourcing? Can I look at automation? Uh, and uh, it's surprising that even in in these times, companies are ready to commit to that investment if they they can see that going forward, uh, they are able to uh, convert a significant part of their fixed cost into variable. Next is uh, building sensing and control tower capabilities. Now, this is something that we used to see a lot in uh, for where global clients used to invest, not so, uh, uh, you know, the smaller Indian companies. But today with, with COVID, a lot of them are realizing that it's important for them to have a central place uh, where they can, uh, uh, you know, track their supply chain, where they can know what is happening, where people can come and collaborate. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that is uh, that is another area where we are seeing a lot of demand. Uh, the sensing part is about really uh, getting not only the organization data but also uh, uh, data from outside the organization, uh, which is which is at many times is unstructured data. So, how do you make sense of of that particular data integrated uh, with uh, with with your data? Apply AI and then be able to get some actionable insights out of this. That is, again, another area where uh, a lot of conversations are happening today. Uh, the next is an interesting one and somehow links with also with the first theme is really the theme of supply chain resilience. Now, if you look at the past, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, then most of the companies went heavily on cost reduction as far as supply chain design was concerned. So they looked at just in time, they looked at, uh, you know, uh, share of business reallocation, etc. But now with COVID, a lot of companies are re-looking at that and, and uh, thinking about how can I reduce the risk of my supply chain and hence maybe build some, uh, uh, some redundancies into the supply chain. And finally, it's, it's about uh, uh, agility in response. And while startups usually don't have that problem uh, uh, and, and big companies do, 
but, but still a lot of companies are asking us about how can they be more agile how can they learn from startups and uh, and you know what are the things that uh, uh, how can the processes be changed in order to uh, uh, make sure that their decisions are fast so uh, these are really the uh, the uh, let's say the seven shifts that we are seeing and uh, uh, amarjeet i don't know if you're there but uh, uh, that's that's what we had to cover today uh, and now we can open up for for questions so i i think uh, manoj for first of all i think this will be the quickest uh, implementation of any advice would have given i actually saw a person called sundar rajan uh, reaching out to other people on chat asking for how we can build synergy and go to market together excellent so oh, wonderful uh, amarjeet are you uh, can you hear us maybe uh, rahul you have to unmute him i can see he's on mute okay i think let's open for questions uh, and maybe uh, if amarjeet is able to connect then we can uh, we can have him speak uh, sure so i think uh, one question again uh, manoj and nangad both of you all can maybe take up is they were asking of how do you see consulting really uh, change in india post lockdown that is the first question that's that's an interesting one and uh, one that we have debated on quite a bit uh so see some things will will not change uh, you know and those are things like uh, in in a, in times of increasing complexity and increasing uh, uh uncertainty clients will reach out uh, and clients will want help uh so so that thing has not changed i think we have seen a lot of opportunities for us to engage with clients talk to them and understand their problems but what has changed is that the clients are and to my point of you know moving the fixed to variable clients are really not willing to uh, pay up front right now just for advice uh, so they want things which are uh, which are outcome oriented which can help them save money which can help them get some tangible outcomes for their business and they are very willing to share a part of uh, the value that has been created uh, so and uh, the other thing that has changed a lot for us in fact in this in this covid times we have started to work a lot on uh, on remote models and in fact there are at least uh, i think three projects where i am involved where things have completely moved to an online model online delivery model it was challenging at first uh, uh, initially we thought we may not be able to do it uh, but honestly as we tried clients were also flexible and actually this goes back to my point of what i was saying on digital transformation that the barriers to do all these things have really gone down and clients are ready to experiment uh, if if you are also ready to uh, be flexible then things can be worked out uh, so these are the let's say the two main things that i see uh, there are of course the obvious things about changing what you are offering uh, you know making sure may helping clients come out of the come out of covid uh, but but those are i think table stakes what is more important is just to be flexible in how you engage with the client even at this time uh you have to be you have to maintain your contact with the client uh and and make sure you are you are relevant uh under anything you want to add i i want to this is amit i think the concept just one point is that that the uh angad maybe we lost you uh, angad are you there amarjeet angad uh, both of you there yeah hi can you hear me this is amarjeet hi amarjeet yes amarjeet yeah both the point which i think uh, manoj made is very important everybody wants a skin in the game today so whenever we go for any consulting advice today uh, what we what people are saying very good it's a great idea we become a partner help us in implementing it and then share the spoil and that's where i think one of the question which has come can we actually have some of the startups uh, when we actually 
take the solutions to our clients we can take them along with us uh, but uh, we are you know but uh, our interactions also are limited to the extent uh, how uh, how how many of them are working along with us uh angad you would like to add two cents maybe uh... yes so one of the other things is earlier we had the leverage of knowing how maybe some of the better organizations are doing it what organizations have learned and they've done differently what we club together as uh, as leading our best practices so today in the scenario with everything changing and us having a situation which is unprecedented a lot of blue sky ideas solutions and and how can things be done differently from scratch is what we are working on with clients and that's a, a that's a new for us as well what i think uh... also there is there's another question maybe amarjit you might be uh, a person is uh, you know how do you kind of look at the government at helping startups or how can startups really leverage government uh, maybe uh, you know for example we of course as kpmg help the gem portal and that is something we are really proud of and of course uh, amarjit was really involved with the entire dpit startup policy when we were uh, really formulating it so amarjit maybe uh, you could uh, identify how the startups could even look at probably government as even a problem business uh, client as far as the government is concerned they can only I think Amarjit is on mute, right? Yeah, Amarjit, uh, you went on to mute. Uh, maybe uh, Rab, I'm sorry, but can you please unmute him again? Uh, I think he was mistakenly muted. Yeah, Amarjit. Uh, so I'm saying that the government can uh, can only help where they interfere. So if they are not interfering, uh, uh, you know, if we if we expect that the government is going to help us in any manner or help us help help us in buying which we are manufacturing uh, or the services which we are providing, it really doesn't happen because uh, for them the way I think it has been actually working. Uh, we have we have seen that you have to, uh, if you are facing that challenge in terms of actually uh, the way you are operating, the government is always ready to listen. But they will not be able to help you in terms of a survival or a funding or any other need. So if you have any ideas, please send it to Amrit uh, because we are in. Uh, I think the government is now going to appoint second set of consultants for startup 2.0. Correct. Uh, and and uh, we have to. uh we we can put all those uh suggestion which come from you to the government yep uh wonderful i think uh, I, i think a lot of more than questions i think they have taken manoj very seriously i can see a lot of people trying to collaborate with each other on the chat uh is there any other questions in terms of uh, what we can help answer please uh, do put on the chat uh, i think uh, there are some questions regarding cash structure as well unfortunately uh, our partner expert who was supposed to talk had a personal emergency maybe we will try to get uh, him on another webinar and plan something very soon so we can help answer your questions regarding how can you really uh, liquidate and how do you kind of go on to the cash part so i think navin there is one thing for you is it's not internationally friendly the timings a uh, very uh, unique question in terms of how do you see this uh, you know pandemic really uh, affecting the global supply chain i i think we have pradeep also on call uh, rab if you could also unmute pradeep i can see pradeep yeah hi how are you 
Is Hi, how is it going? Hi, how is it going? Uh, how's the uh, people are still on it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I I could just join right now. No, no, we were uh, we were actually taking up questions. We were done with our uh, presentation. Uh, Swamarjit and Manoj and Angad, we have three uh, of the panelists from KPMG. Okay. And okay. asking questions and kind of taking their questions and really see how we can help. Okay. So. Uh, you know, one question is that how do entrepreneurs seize on the uh, shift in supply chain that we see? Maybe uh, uh, Manoj and Amarjit, you all can take it up. Is uh, they feel that a lot of manufacturing hubs may. Amit, there are a few questions. Let me uh, answer those, and then uh, how do the startups really capitalize or seize on the topic? Yeah, thanks, Amit. Uh, there are a few questions. Let me try and answer those. Uh, so, first of all, uh, whether this pandemic will give India an opportunity to be a big manufacturing hub. Uh, see, in the media, uh, as you have also mentioned, in the media, there is a lot of uh, news about it. But on the ground, uh, the conversations have just started. The governments have uh, have sort of uh, uh, laid out the red carpet, have made the right noises as far as India is concerned. And today, about labor laws also being relaxed to a certain extent. Uh, but I think uh, this will only uh, mature over the next uh, few quarters at least. And the reason for that is that um, a lot of companies globally are cash strapped and at the same time they have existing investments in, uh, in China. So it will, it will not be that easy for companies to suddenly shift lock, stock and barrel to India. Uh, it will take some time. The intent is there. Uh, and at the same time, I think, uh, 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 there will also need to be, India will also need to take a sort of a ecosystem sort of a strategy. It can't be a one-off thing that they just try and attract uh, uh, one odd companies, but really how do they attract a certain bunch of companies together as an ecosystem. So for right now, I think it will still take a few quarters for us to uh, really, uh, you know, see how this progresses. As much as we are getting inquiries, definitely, I think in terms of some of the uh, American companies and some of the Japanese companies looking at to be investing into India. But you are absolutely right. By the time we structure, it will take time. But I think the bigger and larger issue would be that uh, how, what kind of red carpet we as a country are a, a actually able to spread for these companies. But today, also, I think one of the biggest. Amarjit, Amarjit, can you come on a video, please? Are you on the video? Uh, one of the one of the challenges I think uh, which we face, for example, I am working on a very large project of almost one point billion dollars. Uh, I think by the time some of the approvals are coming from uh, regulators today, uh, there is a lot of frustration which sets in. But I think uh, what is important today is that the startup ecosystem uh, in India should be uh, very much connected to what's happening. Uh, and there will be companies who would be interested in some things which you, which the startup ecosystem is doing. But largely what you will see um, that it will be around manufacturing that uh, entities will shift. On the services side, we have already seen uh, that uh, there are enough companies who have already pres uh, established presence in India. But on manufacturing, it will take time because uh, by the time uh, location study is done, environmental clearance are done, land is purchased, uh, the plant is set up, it, it takes at least three to six quarters for a company to have actually up and running. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Rab, if you could also unmute uh, Angad, unfortunately, uh, please. So another question I've got on personal as well is uh, if uh, we, we spoke skin in the game kind of consulting and what what if we can provide maybe like a case of how we've uh, 
maybe how we take success fee or how do we really help or how do startups put their skin in the game and kind of pivot into that business model uh, any of you all can take up that up that's an interesting question that we got Okay, so there are two parts to this question. Maybe let me try and come in, and then Amarjeet and Angad can uh, uh, pitch in. So uh, one part is how does KPMG do it, as I as I saw on the chat window, and the second part is how do startups do some of this. So I can just share an example of you know what how KPMG is uh, sort of doing some of these deals, and uh, in fact with with smaller companies. So while it is easier to imagine us doing this with a large company. uh but even with smaller companies we are uh, we are entering into some very interesting deals of a case in point is a is a smallish uh, uh, fmcg company where we are helping them uh, uh, you know grow their revenues reduce their costs and at the same time uh, help them raise funds uh, uh, and and the whole uh, value proposition is that if we are able to make their core operations more effective then as and when they raise funds then they will be able to get a better valuation and uh, the the whole deal construct is such that uh, we get paid if we are able to uh, meet certain targets on uh, on the uh, revenue increase and the cost reduction that we achieve for them so that is one example of how we are doing it uh, with startups i think what i have seen uh, happen i can just share a few like i was mentioning earlier in fmcg we are seeing companies come together and uh, uh you know to solve the last last mile end to end uh, uh, delivery problem or provide some automation for for the distributor retailer uh, leg of the journey so there we are seeing some startups offer uh, you know the, go for the freemium kind of a model wherein they give their uh, product or the app or the system free for a few uh, for a short duration let the client try it out and uh, and then go for uh, you know pricing it so that's that's in a way reducing the cost for the customer upfront uh, and then later as and when the use picks up they link the the fee to the to the amount of transactions that are getting done uh, through the channel and link that to the benefit uh, that the client is getting uh, from from use of their platform so that is one example uh, amarjeet angad uh, pradeep please feel free to add okay at various stages where we have done even at stage when Oh, I think I think you covered it. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Go ahead. So, so I'm just reading some of the uh, questions. So, so see, um, yes, sometimes there is fixed fee, and uh, uh, if the more variable fee there is. uh the uh the more risk there is for kpmg and hence the higher is the payout as a percentage of the benefits for the client so that's the that's the logic that we follow uh, uh to keep it fair if the client is uh, willing to uh, pay certain amount of fixed fee then the percentage of benefits that we take reduces significantly uh the other question is what is a smallish fmcg so there this is about uh roughly about uh, 200 odd crores and just on the 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 fee model for fixed and variable and some of the cases what we also try and do is if we can target to some of the other operational parameters which are relevant to the work that we are doing or in turn which a startup is doing so for example if we are looking at something around supply chain maybe if a if the percentage of wastage which is there or the percentage or the accuracy of tracking if it hits a certain kpi then there is a success fee due so it need not be only a percentage it can also be tagged to some of the other metrics depending on what the context is we have also in the past angad and we have worked on proof of concept stage itself where we have looked at the business model and we have said that you know we will take this business model and based on our experience does it hold and they are once we are able to confirm then we uh, we do a back ended kind of a fee uh, because that's where uh, the the startup can get a comfort that it will be able to raise funds why we, we don't guarantee those funds we even at a poc stage also we have done a lot of work in the past uh, so you know we are never averse to working with startup ecosystem uh, especially i am a tax and regulatory expert as of now if you ask me i am doing structuring for seven startups 
in terms of whether they are looking for an international holding company out of Singapore or a BVI or whether they should have an LLP in India. I think those are things I think we constantly keep on doing when it comes to tax advice, structuring advice, etc. But larger business projects are something, you know, if we actually think uh, based upon our interaction uh, with, uh, with a startup, uh, that their business model can actually uh, work uh, very well with what we are, uh, what we also want to do. Uh, we have been able to do success fee, uh, but uh, those are depending upon um, exactly uh, how our interactions are. Thank you, Amartya. So I think uh, that pretty much answers. Of course, some of you want to know how they can connect with us. We do have uh, some startups angle as Amarji had discussed. We do have certain models where we try to see any innovative startup and we can probably work with them on building solutions out. And uh, we, of course, uh, really collaborate with Thai as much as possible and give back. We conduct these webinars and we actually, uh, at uh, even at Thai Corner, we set up clinics uh, periodically where we can answer a lot of questions regarding tax and regulations. So that's that's the different models of engagement that we have with uh, different startups and SMEs. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if if we don't have any other uh, questions, I think uh, Naveen, it would be good time to wrap up. It's four o'clock. Maybe uh, we could just wrap up early if that works with you. I don't see any other questions as such. Yeah, sure. And uh, I think thank you for the session. Uh, I know the session we had a little bit of internet lag and problems, but uh, what I would suggest is that uh, all the startups who have been part of this session, if you could write to us directly on these kind of issues that you want KPMG to look in, uh, perhaps we could do a one on one mentoring, what we do on Wednesdays and Thursdays. We could also set up a half a day session for all of you guys on a one on one basis where you get about 10 to 15 minutes to come quickly and pitch your question to one of the three or four directors and partners and get a, you know, a 20,000 about this feet uh, kind of an uh, idea and then do a sidebar to take it in detail. So, so folks, please do drop in an email to us. I'm sending you an email address on the chat right now. And uh, we'll be happy to connect you with any of the KPMG partners who will be most relevant to answer your questions. And let's do that the very next week where uh, we can kind of then start helping you in realigning your business strategies and goals. And I would like to thank uh, Amrit, Amarjeet, Anoj, Angad, and Pradeepai for all of your uh, help in putting today's session together. Uh, we will try and do as many more as possible. Uh, from what we see now is we require KPMG to help us on all operational issues as and when the lift up is happening in the country. So I think you guys will be more needed uh, in, in helping our startups going forward. Thank you everyone for attending and look forward to engaging with you even more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Tripti. Thank you, everyone.